And today on the bench I've got another Technics tape deck. This is an RSM 17. It's been sent in for repair and it's been sent in with the service manual. <laughs> Happy days. Now I'm told the fault is that there's an awful screaming noise coming out of one of the channels. And the other side plays okay. Last thing this unit's from 1980. We'll find out when we get inside it. But it's a single tape deck and yeah. Lights up nice. We'll just connect something to the uh, line output. Stick it on the scope, see what's happening. Well, I don't know if it actually needs a tape in to play. It's quite early, but it's playing without a tape in. <laughs> and straight away we're seeing that the uh, <laughs> output's quite high on both channels. But that's not what the scope says. What's going on there? Some bit high frequency stuff going on. What is that? Oh, and this is quite high. Oh. I think this might be because there's no tape. This might be the carrier frequency, which might be about 100 kilohertz. This, on the other hand, is never good. <laughs> we could need to put a tape in. Well, I'm not sure that's much better. <laughs> you can see some modulation going on. Yeah, so there we are. There's the audio output, just about. It's been interfered with this noise. What's going on? Try some of these other switches on here. Different Dolby's. Ah. <laughs> Bad all the same. Fair to say the lid's got to come off. <laughs> Caution, do not remove screws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, be careful. Oh, it's oh, it doesn't want to come off. Oh, that end. I think this is its first time. I think it's a 40 year old virgin. Don't look now. <laughs> Imagine a bit of leverage. Ah, that's not too bad. Well, this is very retro. Proper old school, this is. Single sided PCB, and loads and loads of discrete components. In fact, are there any chips on here? Oh, there's a couple. Now, this is a proper chunky mechanism. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Well, I'm thinking this is actually a 1979 model. Um, a few clues motors from the 18th of June 79. The transformer's got 79 written on it. And both of these Dolby chips, the Dolby symbols on there, they also say 7924. Week 24, 1979. Well this unit should be a bit easier to work on. This is chunky like I said. There's not a great deal of wiring. There's only one motor. And I see the tape head outputs are on the separate leads and they have their own clogs. Hmm. And that's got to be the first thing we play with. See if we can make that noise go away. Play button. Well we've still got a lot of noise. Let's pull the one tape head off. Well, we've lost the sound. Maybe we've still got that horrible square wave. Try this one. Oh, I think we found the problem. Well, there's a clue. Something about that channel. Doesn't like the input from the right hand head. Well, I'm not convinced it's going to be the head. Hmm. We'll put it back on. Well, I'm pretty sure the tape head itself isn't going to be causing that. So I think it's something under there. So let's take the bottom off this. This is a great design. Only two screws and it just pulls out the way. Oh, <laughs> there's a third screw. Can't count. And just push it forwards and it comes out. Beautiful. Well this is all nicely laid out, labelled up, and this solder looks great, which it always did in this vintage. It's only till the 90s I started messing around with tin, trying to get rid of lead. Well according to the good book, the service manual, it's telling us that the tape heads over here, first thing they do is go through a switch. And that switch is S1. That's S1, 4, 2, 3 and 1. Mm. Let's go through. I think we should have a look at that. 
and this is S1 here, this big long thing here. It's actually attached to the record button. So pull in like that when you're going to record. It's only got two positions, so it should be easy to measure despite having a load of pins. So in its resting state, the contacts will be on the upper side of this. So we can just go in groups of three. So this should be good, and it is. Skip one down there, that's good. Oh, got it wrong. <laughs> that one's good. That one's good. And on this side, oh, oh, that's <laughs> oh, we found the problem. <laughs> wow, what's the resistance to that? Put the ohms on it. <laughs> That's in a bad way. So I guess if I just short this out with the meter, let's play. Oh, look at that. <laughs> well, that's going to have to come out, and I'm not unsolding that by hand, so <laughs> I'm using this. <laughs> Swines, I've got a bent leg here. Hopefully, just pull out. Yes. Now here's the offending switch. I don't know how many poles this is. <laughs> Lots. I'm wondering whether to just chuck it in the ultrasonic cleaner or strip it and clean it manually. Well, I think the ultrasonic cleaner is going to be safer, but it's been such high resistance, I want to see how bad it is. Let's crack it open. So, I think all we've got to do is bend these tangs out of the way. This is quite a solid switch, so this might not be so easy as some of the smaller ones, which are made of much thinner metal. Should be good enough, I hope. And there we are. That's the first set of contacts. Don't look too bad from here. And that's the other side. Here's a close up view of the contacts on here. You can see that these are actually wider on the one side. These are actually what they call make before break contacts so as I slide across there's never a, like a complete disconnect which is typical for a sound switching circuit and this is the offending dodgy one and it doesn't look that bad I can't see why. Is there a bit of green slime there? Yeah it doesn't look terrible but all of these contacts they're all the same on here is not the case for the other section over here. This has got quite a, an assortment. Um, one of the contacts is actually a spring, <laughs> which we need to be very careful about how we handle that. We don't that flying off. But we can see most of these contacts are similar. We got here a wide one is a make before break, so is this. Um, this one isn't. And that one's different as well. Same both sides. Yeah, need to make note of that. So I'm now going to carefully remove these for cleaning.
and same on the <laughs> for the other set. Okay, it doesn't look too bad from here. Oh, there is a bit of a blemish. Hmm. Yes, make a little note. These these are all make before break. And these ones are different. What I'm going to do is load these contacts up on a piece of paper, so I can give the so I can give them a good old scrub. Let's give them a little squirt with some cleaner. Get on both sides and just ride these along. And that black line is the muck coming off. Put them in the uh, <laughs> clean pile. Just wash some of this old residue off. I suspect it's had a bit of switch cleaner in it before. They don't look as black as I was expecting, not for being 40 years old. Just to spruce up these end bits, let's use a fiberglass pencil on them. That just really cleans them up nicely. Now reassembly is just <laughs> quite straightforward, it's just the reverse. Just need to carefully put these back on. And the next trick is to line them all up so they're in that position. So we're all pointing to the bottom. Oh no, wasn't there? <laughs> the trick is to line them all up so they all point to the top. These need to be fairly well aligned or I should have trouble putting it back together. This end of the switch had a bit of variety about it. So we start with the standard make before break contacts. And then it went a bit off piste. So then these third contacts are these type here, which are slightly different. And a pair of standard contacts again. And then a chunky contact at the end. We line all these to the top. And that leaves that little spring contact to put in. It's going to need some persuasion. Well, that's it. <laughs> you sit down straight. Well now this is a treacherous time trying to insert this into this. And if I let go of this it wants to lift up. So I've got to keep a finger on there.
There we go. Now just to pinch those little tabs up. Just a little quality check. Check that one there. That should work just as I nudge it. Yes. And all the way in it stops. So that end pin's only there when it's in between positions. Clever that is. So all the others should be working on the outside. Yeah. Lovely. Flip it over. I think I'm going to use one of these little clamps. There we are. So now we're testing the other part. So that one should be off, that is. One. Now that's perfect. I'm happy with that. Let's get it back in. Let's see how that's worked. Well that looks a lot better. <laughs> now the test tape is a continuous tone, it's stereo, it's 3 kilohertz, so it's great for doing analysis on. Um, and you also don't get copyright infringements. <laughs> You can just see a little bit of wobbling around on there. And I think this is a problem with the belt drive. If I put my finger on it, it feels a bit rough. This really is a borderline case whether you actually tr change it or not. Depends on the customer if they're bothered, but yeah, we'll do it. does mean the front panel's got to come off as well. The hidden screw, but where? <laughs> well, maybe the knob's going to come off. Oh, well, not like that. Oh, it's another gluing job. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Two knobs to glue together. And you just know I'm going to forget to put these back on. <laughs> that can come off as well. I'm thinking I just need to take these red screws out. Well, there's more sneaky bits. I think these little screws have to come out. Some of you may be wondering why I don't use the service manual right now. But I'll be honest, it's not that <laughs> great a help. It's more useful when you're stuck and putting it back together. The little circuit there. Let's flick that off. 
and now that can lift away. Now that reveals a few more screws. Oh, I just realised this isn't going to come out as easily as I thought. <laughs> There's a lot of cables that are soldered to the board in many places. And I don't think I need to take it out. Um, I think I can get it out from behind. Yeah, I just need to unscrew this plate off here. And that will allow me to take the belt off. I can get this screwdriver... Oh, it's tight. Oh, this could go wrong. Well, screws longer than I thought. Yes. <laughs> Push that back a bit, give me a bit more room. There's another one. And we're off. I think this has got to come off as well. Get that screw out. I think he just sort of flicks off. There we go. That wasn't that easy, was it? <laughs> and the state of this motor pulley won't be helping things. It's got a bit of mm, residue on it, I think. Or is it corrosion? Let's see if I can clean it off. I could be here all day doing this. <laughs> I might power the motor up. Well that looks better, a bit of a smoother ride. <laughs> we should do a similar thing for the capstan. Let's see how mucky it is. Well we've got a new drive belt, we'll see how it works with this on. Need to put the belt around this pulley and so it comes out the bottom of this housing here. Just keep a bit of tension on there. Then we've got to gauge this top part into a slot. Okay, and just give it a push down, it clicks into place. And then just feed the belt onto the capstan roller. And hopefully, it will feed on all the way around. Ah. <laughs> but not like that. Like that. And we'll clean this off here as well. And that's, that wasn't much grease in it anyway. <laughs> Let's give it a little dab of fresh grease on there. Just offer it back into place. Long screw one in the top. And a little one down there. Let's 
An awkward to reach, right in the corner. I'm going to put that little <laughs> screw underneath the motor, fiddly to get to, sort of feed it through like that. Let's feed the belt back onto here. And that similarly just snaps in like the motor did. Let's pop the little screw in. And whilst I've got it exposed, I might as well clean the heads. And anything else, it's the raised head there. It's the raised head there. And I think this uh, capstan looks pretty spanking clean. And this pinch roller, let's give that a bit of a, a wipe. I'm going to demagnetise the heads as well. I've got this <laughs> pretty vintage old <laughs> demagnetiser that uh, my dad gave me. I think it was his. This old relic's from the 60s, I would think. Um, some simple instructions there. Hmm. They're yeah, pretty easy to use. It's just a coil of wire in here and an iron core, which uh, this extends out of. And the idea is that you just present a, an AC <laughs> or an alternating magnetic field to the head and you slowly withdraw it to weaken the field, and that leaves you with no magnetism. So just offer it close to the head, press the little button. And it's humming. Just withdraw it slowly. That's it. We can also demagnetize the rollers just in case. Well, that'll do. Let's get the spring on here, sort of hooks in there and under that. Nice action. Let's try that test tape again. That seems to be working better. Let's give it a little check over on the uh, main board. And when it was all going so well, I found some of these capacitors, there's some green corrosion. I don't know how many are affected. Hmm. Yeah, 220 mic, 6.3 volts, and yeah. I think it's uh, electrolytes started to leak a bit. You can see that corrosion there. Luckily, we caught it early, it's not done any damage to the copper. 
Well, to put a nice new one in. High voltage rating, but yeah, similar size, at least it fits. There's another one here that's a bit crusty look. Well, I can see me changing quite a lot of these caps in the end. Well, there can't be much left to adjust on this, <laughs> so let's put the test tape in. This little screw here is a head azimuth adjustment, basically the angle that it tracks. As you wind it in and out, you can affect how it plays back. What you want to do is knock it off centre, bring it back till it peaks, two goes back the other way, and you'll find where you've got the perfect balance of the channels and they're in phase. And now I can check the speed of the tape um, and <laughs> see if it's right. It should be 3 kilohertz, so I'm just going to plug it into a frequency counter. Now it is running a little bit quick, ah, only like 1% maybe. I'll just tweak it back. Speed adjuster is inside the motor. Let's poke a screwdriver through the cover. Try and engage it. Yes, yeah, about as good as it's going to get. Well, I think that's it. I'm going to start putting the front panel on and get this back together. Let's not forget to put this on. I think it just clips in there. There we are. And let's not forget to put these switch <laughs> covers on. That would be very typical of me to forget that part. Let's put this bracket on. I think this is to uh, complete the earth from the front panel to the side. Let's plop a few screws in. Get this lid on, <laughs> or lid, whatever you call the bottom. What do you call a lid that's on the bottom? Hmm. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I've changed screwdrivers this time. Use the uh, Japanese one that fits perfectly. That's a lot nicer to use. And a final functional test. Check this works. Fast forward in, yes. Rewind. That's working beautifully. I'm really happy. I hope Sid's happy with it. Catch you next time.